uh, good uh, network uh, with very little trouble. Um, mesh node owners from different parts of the country will join any existing mesh just by coming within range of it. So let's say, for instance, you are a uh, snowbird. And you go to Phoenix in the winter because you just don't really like the winters we've had around here lately. <laughs> uh, you can take your mesh node with you, and if there's a mesh somewhere where you are, you turn your mesh node on, and it automatically joins that mesh. There's no, again, there's no configuration. It's just automatic. It joins it join up with that mesh. Uh, so bottom line, several mesh nodes plus one experienced ham operator equals affordable quick deployment Swiss Army Knife network service. So how does it work? Now, as long as one node can see another device on the network and talk to other devices on the network, and each node can relay track between them. Between any two computers or devices, you can have multiple paths doing redundancy in case a node goes down. And the paths of different quality are automatically considered. If one path is worse than another, that path will get less traffic. And again, that's part of the OSR. If a node is, that is in use goes down, the surrounding nodes will automatically figure out an alternate route to pass the traffic using the OLSR protocol. Uh, the best routes automatically determined and use. And items connected to nodes, again, can be any network-enabled device, computers, IP webcams, IP phones, web, email, file servers, you know, network to test storage. You can have a cloud storage device out there on a node somewhere and use a, some kind of a cloud storage. Um, basically, anything that can communicate over a standard TCP IP network will work over the bar and handnet system. Okay. This is a uh, diagram of Austin's mesh network, or at least this is what they're working on. I don't know that this is actually a completed system, but this is their plan for their system. Uh, and it kind of helps us understand how the mesh works, because we can kind of look at it a little bit and break it down. Um, We've got this computer up here that's A, and he's tied to this mesh node. And we've got this computer down here that's B, and he's tied to this mesh node. Well, the primary path to that, to, between those two computers might be through this system here, through this node to this node to this node down here. Okay, so if, say for instance, this node goes out, or that node goes down, or maybe you know, all three of those nodes go down, the path would automatically change. Again, this is transparent to the user. And then the path would become something like this, from this node to this node, to this node, to this node, then back down to this node. So the path would be completed using those nodes instead of the nodes on this side of the path. So, so that kind of just gives you an idea of how the, the, the net mesh can work. And then on the same, same uh, kind of idea here, uh, you've got this C computer and this D computer. And they're tied via this one, or they're actually, they're tied via this node. Let's say they're tied via this node. Let's say this node drops out. Then they could be tied via this node. If he drops out, then they would go from this node to this node to this node to this node to that node. So, so the mesh stays up no matter what happens. If you have nodes leaving or coming into the mesh, they're all, the mesh is always going to be there always again. Uh, the hardware that's required. Again, we talked about this just a little bit. The Cisco Systems Linksys WRT54G series consumer grade routers. Uh, they do have to be loaded with broadband hamnet firmware. That can be found on the, at broadband-hamnet.org. Um, the system cannot be version 5 or higher. All other versions are supported. Um, and the reason it can't be version 5 or higher is because Cisco went to a different hardware for, at version 5 and they reduced the internal ROM to 2K instead of 4K. And Meg, Meg I'm sorry, thank you. Yeah, 2 Meg. Sorry. Oh, those are older. They're really good dates, <laughs> man. <laughs> I know, I'm showing my age. Huh? Yeah, so they went to, from 4 Meg to 2 Meg, and the, the Hamnet stuff just does not fit in 2 Meg. So you can't use a version 5 or higher router. Um, and the 54G version 1, be aware it uses regulated 5 volts. So if you want to run, you know, a remotely on a battery or something, just be aware that a 1, oh, you're going to have to have some kind of regulator or something, a 7805 or something to get it down to 5 volts if you're going to try to drive it off a of 12. So that's something to be aware of. Um, for specific details, there's a document on the Broadband Hamnet worksite 
the W54shot.pdf. And these guys have basic, basically broken down every single version of router that's out there. And they tell you in the chart whether or not that router is going to work with, that, with the firmware. And uh, in fact, one guy said, he said, you know, I just took the PDF file and, and, and copied it to my smartphone. And I can just, if I'm out at a ham fest or something and I see a router, I can bring the PDF file up and find out immediately if it's one I can use or not. So. <laughs> and the 12 volts use unregulated power? Is that what they're saying? There's a regulator in the box. Yeah. Right. Right. So the 12 volts you can just hook up to whatever your car. Right. Yeah. Battery yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they actually take. Um, I think they'll take down to six. I think they'll go like six to. Probably up to 14. 14. Yeah. Something like that. So you can plug in your cigarette lighter, no problem. Oh yeah. Yeah. You can plug in your cigarette lighter, no problem. Um, there's not a lot of protection in there though, so I wouldn't give it too trashy power. Well. No. Yeah. Yeah. So you look at the little switcher. And then um, another option, you can get a Raspberry Pi running either HSMM Pi or HSMM Mesh software, and any USB Wi-Fi module, and you can make a, a note out of that. And I have an example here. I have a, a, a Raspberry Pi that's running HSMM Pi, and a little bit later we'll bring it up, and it's on an IP camera, and we'll have some fun with that. But um, you, can, you can also use you know, a, a Raspberry Pi for, for a Mesh node if you, if you prefer to do it that way. There actually is an option three that just was released uh, last month, I think, and I haven't had time to update my presentation <laughs> since I wrote it. But they now, uh, the uh, Broadband Handnet folks just announced that they now have software, the uh, Broadband Handnet uh, firmware, excuse me, the Broadband Handnet firmware for the Ubiquity, uh, the Ubiquity systems. And we have a couple of Ubiquities here. Oh, we have one, yeah, Ubiquity over there in the corner. That's a, uh, that's the ubiquity, and that, those are actually very nice because the router and everything is built right into the the center feed horn of the antenna, basically. So it's all. So we've got all there. three options going. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. So we've got all three options here <laughs> going. And we'll play a little bit. I've got uh, <laughs> this other system that I have here. I've got another Raspberry Pi, and that Raspberry Pi is running um, the Asterisk PBX server. So we're going to get a couple of voice IP phones going here with the Asterix PBX server, and I will show you how that works too. It's kind of fun. Got a little bit of stuff to do. Um, but so those are your options. What's available? What's out there? Antenna options. They're all kinds. You get circular, rectangular, flat panel from 8 to 24 dB gain. I can get the 12 element beams or 16 element beams, and those get 20 to 24 dB gain. Or you can get verticals, uh, you know, omnidirectional verticals from 8 to 15 dB gain. So there are a lot of antenna options out there. And all those options were in part 15, right? No. No. Those options are part 97. Okay. Be, uh, yeah, those are your. Can't do any of that with part 15. No. No. What's, your, what's your limit in part 15 dB wise? What it comes with. What it comes with. <laughs> what it comes with. Oh, I say you can't. Anytime you put a higher bigger antenna on, you're out. Right. Well, yeah. That's why I have reverse TNC, so that people couldn't just go out and buy a normal you know, yeah. antenna with a TNC on and plug it in. Yeah. Right. Try to make it hard trick. Make it harder, yeah, it's not going to help. But, uh, as far as modifying the routers, it's pretty straightforward. Um, there is a very good YouTube video. A guy actually goes through it step by step on how to, um, how to modify one of these things. I mean, there's not a whole lot to it. You basically, Get the firmware from the broadband handset site, and again, it's it's spelled out what version of firmware goes for what version of, of uh, router and everything. Now. So it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you use one of the Ethernet ports to get into the the uh, menu of the router. You have to go out and log in, and you, there's an option. It's in administration. There's an option to update the software, and you basically just use the update software option. And you point it to the software that you've downloaded from the Broadband Hamnet site. It takes about a minute to update the software, and you're done with the software. Actually, I have a correction to you. Uh, part 15 says you can have uh, uh, 30 dBm radio output with 23 dB of gain. Really? So your act actual PIRP is 53 dBm. Wow. Okay. I didn't realize that was. Yeah, that's still you're still within Part 15. Really? Okay. Huh. I was gonna say because I, I knew I set up a thing like that we had a one watt amplifier on it. Oh, okay. So yeah, you can have quite okay. A I thought it was. Is that what you guys are running? 
I guess that kind of makes sense because you can buy two watt Wi-Fi. Yeah. 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 Ye
directional system. And you can see they've just got the, the Omni plugged into just one of the antenna ports on the Cisco. Okay. And this is one that they've got. I think that's on top of a hospital in Austin somewhere. And that's a, a standard unidirectional. However, actually, I think they lied on this picture a little bit because if you notice, there's another piece of coax that's going up here. I have a feeling there's probably an omnidirectional. Yeah, I think on you top of the I mean, How would high speed unidirectional work with the mass? I mean, isn't that limit yeah. to how who you can connect to? Well, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yes. I, mean, I think that's why you got both. Oh, yeah. Get range so you can expand from your local node. To some other to node. To some other node. Right. Then you got the yeah, other ones. So you, yeah. you have two of these guys with the, the direction. Right. So you got those two guys. You get those guys maybe a couple miles apart. Right. And then you got, and then the, so that's for the long distance, and then the little ones for the local. Yeah. Right. The local ones. Wireless G is not MIMO, so what they're probably doing is your okay. transmit is actually going through the directional so you get the range, and then the omnidirectional, which doesn't matter for range, is for the receiving. So that's kind of like our. Well, so uh, diversity um, yeah, is So either so when it gets the most signal is going to go out, yeah. you know, it's going to come in <laughs> or go out. If it's uh, transmit wise, I don't know how we can get transmit wise. Uh, yeah, usually for the, the same for diversity, you kind of have your TX and RX. So one one uh, actual port will be TX and one will be RX. Yeah. Well, we go out there. Frank, I did hear a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. We're, we're talking about the diversity mode antennas. You, you've done some research on it. So how does that actually play out then? Like if you have an Omni on one port and a unidirectional on another port. The way, it's, uh, the way it was originally designed to work is basically the loudest signal it hears, it then retransmits that, assuming you're moving through a node for the other antenna, a null or something like that. When you have a high gain point-to-point uh, -point antenna or directional antenna and an omni on the other one, as you suggested in your email last night, you've got a link to a distant node that could be miles away, maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Someday. The theory is. Someday. But not uh, 2.3 miles away. And plus then you've got a local local access <laughs> to other mesh networks. Your, your PC can't directly talk to that om or through that omni antenna. But if you have uh, two Red Cross disaster centers separated by five miles and line of sight between the two, you could put two dishes on the roof, tie them to one set of ports, and then two Omnis on the other with some small meshes in that uh, center for uh, disaster recovery. Now the question, well, being, being, has TX and the question being is one antenna going, the transmit antenna, and the other one to receive antenna, or how does it know if which one to transmit? On, on the basic setup page, there's a, a box in the bottom right that says active settings. Can, well, you're in the middle of your presentation. Uh, and you can select an antenna and say, this is the left antenna, transmit right, receive, even though there's no standard to left and right. Or you can set one or both to diversity. If you leave them both in diversity, they're going to listen for the strongest signal and use that antenna. And generally, the directional is going to hear the strongest signal from the remote site, though it may be responding to local other mesh yeah. traffic. But what about transmit? Same thing. The, the same antenna transmits and receives. Okay. In diversity mode. In diversity mode, diversity. correct. But if you're coming in on the uh, high gain from a remote and well, you're really not coming that. in. You're you're connected, so you've got in and out right. on the high gain antenna. Right. Well, that's good. Okay. Transmit and receive. Yeah. 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 Well, it should not know that. But I mean, I'm I'm missing the question. The, uh, so switching. it depends on the mode. It depends on if it's in diversity if, mode. Yeah, or not. assuming that you're in diversity mode. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and I, I missed the question. I guess, I guess. If in diversity mode. Right, it's pretty much auto select, so it will actually take in the higher signal in diversity mode. Mm -hmm. But generally, uh, you have one or the other that's RX and PX on it. So you can also set up one if you want to just go to the cheap route. A lot of people with this, instead of actually using both ports for the antenna, they have one gigantic omnidirectional. They'll set RX and TX for the one antenna. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, how Broadcom here at Shep sets work, they, they you could you could select T, uh, RX or TX for one or um, for each antenna, or uh, you could do both through that RX TX through one antenna. Okay. So you could RX on one side, TX on the other side, or you could do combine both on one. Mm -hmm. I think if you have a gain antenna, having a second antenna is just going to add more noise, so it really isn't to your advantage. Exactly. Yeah, there's, uh, interestingly, I was looking at part 15, there's something called the FCC special rule number two, and you can actually have pretty massive effective radiated towers. 
their standard under Part 15 for a point. This is specifically for point-to-point -point links. You're allowed uh, one watt with a 6 dB gain antenna for an EIRP. That's effective gain over isotropic. Yeah, that's 36 decibels. Yeah, which is four watts, 36 dB. Yeah. But uh, for each dB that you reduce your intentional radiator, which is your radio output, you can, or I'm sorry, for each 6 dB that you reduce your intentional radio output, you can go up 3 dB on your gain antenna. Yeah. So for example, if you take your radio down to from um, uh, from one watt down to uh, 160 milliwatts. 30 decibels, one watt. Yeah, so. yeah. So you're going from from plus 30 dBm down to 22 dBm. You can go with a 30 dB gain antenna, yeah. which gives you an EIRP of 158 watts. Yeah. So you, you can go massive distances if you have line of sight. Now remember, if you go over 20 miles, the curvature of the Earth starts to get to you, so you got to go yeah. up pretty high because the you can't have line of sight. Now that's over. unlicensed then. Or yeah, that's un that, that, apparently it's unlicensed. Yes, that's pretty, and that's specifically point to point. That point. That's I think that's for point four five point eight gigahertz and this is two nine hundred megahertz. Yeah, this this says uh, this is uh, the two point four gigs. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think it's five point eight. Yeah, five point eight. Uh, just a standard access. Let's but, see. But yeah, your maximum EIRP at, at 5.6 is so two, 200 watts. Yeah, yeah, but you're coming across the same problem though. With, even though you have that capability, most of the uh, regulations that you see yeah. for those, like that loops this router, decibel gain, it probably maxes out about, I think, 18 decibels at max. Um, I don't know if you can prove it. If you even increase it beyond that, it's going to create too much noise. Yeah, the noise will get you. That, a, lot, yeah, a lot of people try to crank the, the radios in, yeah. the, in the, like, the little, uh, like, uh, tomato and, and uh, <coughs> w, uh, the, uh, what's it, w, uh, DDWRT. But the, the little, uh, they use an like MAR6 or something amplifier, a little monolithic amplifier, and those produce so much noise that well a lot of that's true hardware real. cap too so yeah. like you could say that in the software saying that you could actually go beyond 14 decibels so you can put at 30 decibel they'll, they'll still actually the hardware will cap it at 14 decibels so it'll in your like GUI where it'll show your actual gain for decibels they still be the same yeah. then you'll just increase the noise in the system so it won't do anything <laughs> yeah right you're no gain uh here's, here's another example Rob Van Hammond in the box. That's kind of what I was doing over there too at the uh, Raspberry Pi. There he is on the Cisco router instead of a Pi. Um, Rob Van in a backpack. Uh, again, like we said, it's very low power. And uh, somebody actually sat down and did testing on, on these things. <laughs> and they do have a maximum, I was very, the maximum power output is 79 milliwatts. So it's you know, obviously yeah. not much. Yeah. Uh, it accepts from 4 volts to 16 volts, but here's just an idea of what you can run one of these things on. Even 4 AA batteries, you can get about an hour and a half on 4 AA batteries on one. Um, now obviously, a 55 amp hour sealed lead acid.